Hello and welcome to week 11, Plates of the Lithosphere. I'm Professor Rios and I hope you're doing well. Good morning, afternoon or evening, whenever you're watching this. Uh, as we move on to week 11 and the second week of unit five, uh, we begin to look at some of the forces that shape the landscapes that you are familiar with, maybe you visited, maybe you watched about on television. So without any further ado, let's get going. Here in the background, you see Mount Fuji in Japan. Sort of very iconic, beautiful cone-shaped mountain volcano uh, near Tokyo, to the southwest of the city of Tokyo, Japan. Uh, it forms under very specific, or it formed under very specific circumstances, which we will cover today. So these are the objectives, identifying the types of plates, the forces, and the faults. Um, the types of volcanoes, the different types of earthquakes as far as intensity and magnitude, and so on. So when you look at this mountain here, this volcano, very distinctive cone, you can see ash coming out from the top. You can see different flows that have over the millennia formed the landscape that you see there. Um, this is a very specific type of rock that comes out of this type of volcano, basalt. There you can see by the dark black color, not unlike what you would find, say, in the state of Hawaii. So there are different pieces of evidence that are often used in order to help corroborate the theory of plate tectonics. And just as a little side note, a theory necessarily doesn't necessarily mean that it hasn't happened or that it is uh, potential, but a theory has been studied. A theory has been tested for many, many, many years. So a theory has quite a bit of backing to it. So let's just sort of get that out there right now. But these are the four. So let's look at each individually. The idea of seafloor spreading, the fact that you have these different plates that have over time either moved away from one another or towards one another, or they're constantly interacting. And this interaction has formed mountains and volcanoes and ocean trenches or underwater mountain chains like mid-ocean ridges. Okay. And the whole the whole reason for these tectonic plates moving is convection from hot molten material inside of the earth so you've heard of pangea you've heard of the idea that that the continents were once all connected as one rather large mass it was initially proposed by alfred wegener a climatologist the only issue then was he had no way of actually corroborating or collecting the evidence so the first is the fit of land masses. The idea that Africa and South America connected at one point, and you have to think about not only what you presently see as South America and Africa, but also the, um, what are called the uh, continental shelves or the very shallow ocean that during an ice age would have been exposed as actual land. If, for example, present day North American Appalachian Mountains, New England, uh, Labrador would be connected to what we call Scotland and Norway today, and Northern uh, Sweden and Finland. Now they are separated by an ocean as the mid-ocean ridge right about here separates this plate, which is called the European or Eurasian plate, from the North American plate. 
Another one would have been fossil evidence, meaning land moving animals and finding the fossils in South America, just like you do in Africa. That tells you that at one point, those two pieces of land were connected because these animals didn't swim or fly. Earthquakes and volcanoes and the distribution. If you actually look at the earth by just simply focusing on volcanoes and earthquakes and where they tend to happen the most, you get a sense of the different plates that are available. So these little dots and triangles basically paint your boundary borders. And then, of course, with seafloor spreading, because where the ocean is splitting apart, the ocean tends to be younger, right about there, versus where the ocean spread apart long ago, meaning it spreads apart here and moves in this direction and in that direction, meaning this is older. Look at the blue color. And this is younger. Look at the red and orange and yellow. So this is the idea of paleomagnetism in a way of being able to date the age of the sea floor. These are the different plates. So we sit on the North American plate, which covers almost every bit of North America and the United States with little, with few exceptions. Notice the mid-ocean ridge in the middle of the Atlantic, separating the um, African plate and the Eurasian plate. Notice how it goes right through Iceland. Currently, there's volcanic activity going on there. Of course, this plate right here, separating Europe from Africa. And then you have a plate boundary between South America and the Nazca plate, and this is where the Andes form. So there's a very good rhyme and reason to what you see. So let's look at some of the motions and the interactions. You can have what are called transform boundaries. These are ones that are sliding past one another. Think about San Andreas in California. You can have convergent boundaries. And these are ones that are basically colliding with one another. And you can have divergent boundaries. These are boundaries that are basically splitting apart or going away from one another at a central point. So divergent boundaries, mid-ocean ridge in the Atlantic. Convergent boundary, you can have ocean to continent collision. An example of that would be the Andes Mountains and the Cascade Range of Washington and Oregon. Here you have one plate that is thinner and heavier. Think about the idea of Mayfic from last week. It's being shoved under this thicker but less dense continental plate, Felsic. So this is considered a destructive boundary because one rock layer is being shoved under the other. You can have ocean to ocean collision. And these tend to form island arcs like the illusions of Alaska, where the Philippines are, will be another example. It is also a destructive boundary rock is being destroyed via that same process of shoving one plate under the other. The next one would be continent to continent, and this is pretty rare. There's really only one, and this would be the Himalayas, where you have one continental plate colliding with another continental plate. That would be the continent of India colliding with Eurasia, forming the mountain range that we know as the Himalayas. No big surprise, this is where you find all of the world's big, tall mountains, like Everest and K2. 
the second tallest mountain in the world. Transform plate boundaries are not unusual. In the United States, we find it in Southern California all the way through San Francisco. So San Francisco, Los Angeles, San Diego, uh, and the northern portion of Mexico, basically Baja California, there you have one plate that is sliding past one another. So there is no subduction going on. There is simply movement past it. Think of it as a pair of scissors, the same type of sheer action. The Pacific Ring of Fire, I am sure you have heard this term, and this is mostly, not entirely, but mostly convergent boundaries where you tend to find volcanoes and earthquakes pretty much all the time. So think about the state nation of Japan. Think of the Philippines. Think of Indonesia. Think of Papua New Guinea and all these volcanic islands all the way down to New Zealand. These are all very seismically active and also very volcanic. So now let's focus on boundaries, forces, and the faults associated with each. So you tend to have compression, extension, and shear force. So with this type of fault, you tend to have this type of force. Reverse fault, compression force. Normal fault, extension force. Think about it. Think, think about taking a rubber band and pulling at it from both ends. You're extending it. You're making it longer. So how do rocks react to stress? Well, they do so in several ways. One, they can fold like plastic. They can rupture, they can break, and they can bounce back. Okay, so there's, there are three ways rocks can react. So a fault line, and hopefully you can see the fault line right through here. It's a fracture in the material that is displaced with respect to another part of that rock. Earthquakes. Think about stress being applied. The rocks either deform, and if the stress is too much, they will break and release energy in the form of what are called seismic waves. So here's an example. Look at this road. Look how this road was displaced with respect to itself. And if he, were sta if he had been standing here when this happened, you literally would have seen it happened instantaneously. So for a normal fall, you have extension force, reverse, and thrust. A thrust is nothing more than an extreme reverse. You have compression. And for a strike slip or transform, you have a shear force. Okay? So now, let's look at a normal fall. This is looking at it as if you were standing in front of it. Think of this as a wall. And think of the fault right through here. I don't know if you can actually see the line, but there it is. And now you're going to apply extension force. So what's going to happen to either side of that wall? Well, this is going to slide down and this is going to slide up with respect to the other one. So this is a normal fault, divergent boundary, extension force. Okay. Now let's look at a normal fault from how your book addresses it. Notice this right here. So this would be called the foot wall. This would be called the hanging wall. This is down thrown. This is up thrown. So let's go back to this. See it right there? This right here would be this. Mm -hmm. 
Now, a normal fault in nature, there they are. Can you see it? Look at that black colored rock on the image on the left and the white colored rock. See how they've been displaced with respect to one another? Now reverse fault, it's a convergent boundary. So the force is gonna be compression. You're gonna be shoving them together. Notice you still have the fault line right about there. And then when you put them together or you push them together via compression force, you get this. Does that make sense? Think about it. You get those two pieces of land, you shove them together and one has to go up and the other one has to go down. So this is a reverse fault, compression force, or a convergent boundary. So let's look at it from your book's perspective. Again, this image right here, or this side view, is this side view right here. So this is what you tend to find in nature. What happens is over time, and this is again, a real, I mean, think about this track was destroyed immediately, right? Obviously you wouldn't build it like this, or you wouldn't build it into a very highly variable terrain. You, you want to build a track in a very flat place. So clearly, had you been standing here when this happened, you literally would have seen it take place immediately. Now you can have faults with two fault lines. So you're basically applying extension force and you can have a valley sink into higher with higher terrain on either side. Or you can have the opposite where you can have a hill or a ridge line with valleys on either side in the united states we have a place where this happens first you have the african rift valley will be probably the world's most best example of this and that would be right along the rift valley right here or in idaho utah and the state of nevada you tend to have that. And that's what it looks like. Valley, ridge, valley, ridge, valley, ridge, and so on. And that would be this right here. You find it in Utah as well. You find it in Idaho and even Southern Oregon, actually. A transform boundary is California, San Andreas, the so-called earthquake zone of California. And these are different boundaries that are basically moving past one another. So when you look at it from the perspective of force, there's no up and down motion. It's mostly side to side. So there is the actual fault. You can see it from the air. It's actually very interesting to, to literally see one plate on one side and the other plate on the other. So this is the North American plate. This is the Pacific plate. You're literally seeing it right there. And the reason you can see it is because it's dry climate. So you're not really having an obstructed view due to um, vegetation. So it's a strike slip fault. And because of this, you tend to have really weird little um, features like streams that do weird like 90 degree angles. And there you see it. Rivers are not supposed to do this right there, which means this move this way, that move that way, and it created this bizarre looking 90 degree turn. 
over time, water will reshape and re-round the, the stream to look normal again. But for a while, you'll get this weird looking stream. And there you see it again. Take a, take a quick look. Lay on, linger on the image for a second. Right? The water comes down and suddenly it goes, wow. And then it keeps going. This means this was at one point here. Holding. So what's the force here? Compression. And compression can do this to the earth. One such place in the, in the country where you tend to find this would be the state of Pennsylvania even southern New York, West Virginia, Virginia, and Maryland. So let's look at volcanoes now. So here's a beautiful cone-shaped mountain. This is Mount Mayon in the Philippines. It is a composite volcano, and it formed in the vicinity of a convergent ocean-ocean boundary. Very distinctive-looking cone. This is Mount Rainier in Washington State, southeast of the city of Seattle. It is also a composite volcano found along a convergent continent ocean boundary. This is a 14,000 foot mountain that is ringed by glaciers and still very active. It's not extinct. It is, it's just dormant at the moment. So let's look at the types of volcanoes. You tend to have shield, composite, and flood basalts. So lava or magma, when it's inside the earth, can either be very highly viscous, chunky, very mo slow moving, or it can be very runny, low viscosity, like what you find in Hawaii. And if you've watched the news about the volcano in Iceland or the volcano in Spain, uh, those are both low viscosity lava. They're very, very runny. Uh, they are basically uh, magma that has very little gas in it. The gas has been slowly let go versus this type of magma, like what you find in Washington state which is basically full of gas, and they can be a lot more explosive. So these are shield volcanoes. Look at the magma there. Look how runny it looks. It even takes the shape of a river, essentially. They are very large and gently sloped. The magma is fluid, and the eruptions tend to be relatively quiet. This is found in the vicinity of a hot spot. Hawaii is one. Iceland is another. The Galapagos Island is another. And in Hawaii, right now, only the big island is volcanically active because the hot spot stays fixed, but the plate moves over it. So only the activity remains where the hot spot happens to be. So here's Hawaii. The hot spot is right here, so only this island is volcanically active. Maui and Molokai and Lanai and Oahu and Kauai, these are now volcanically inactive. So there's no threat of volcanic activity in any of those islands, only in the big island of Hawaii. Composite volcanoes are very large as well, but they're smaller compared to a shield volcano. So these tend to have very thick, viscous magma. The eruptions tend to be far more explosive, and they are tend to found in the vicinity of convergent plate boundaries or a subduction zone. Here's an example of a composite volcano. This is Mount St. Helens in Washington. This is the site of the last eruption in the United States, or at least the continental United States. Okay, 
uh, a little more into this one coming up. That's what it looked like in May of 1980. Notice how there's no red here, it's all ash. It is far more dangerous than what's going on in Hawaii at the moment. And in the United States, for example, Northern California, Oregon, Washington, and uh, British Columbia and Canada, you tend to have many volcanoes that fit that description. Okay. So here's Mount Rainier to the southeast of Seattle. I think I said southwest. So originally it's southeast of Seattle, Washington. Uh, Mount Pinatubo, this is in the Philippines. This erupted in 1991. It is a composite volcano and it is also found in the vicinity of a convergent boundary. Look at that explosion. It's not red and full of fluid magma. It's very, very, very ashy, very, very violent. And the magma is a lot less runny, but very violent and dangerous. Here's an image of Mount St. Helens. That on the upper left corner is what it looked like before it erupted. And what you see on the main image is basically what happened after it blew up. So basically the mountain lost over a thousand feet in elevation in about a minute. So it's the world's biggest landslide recorded in history. There may have been bigger in the past, but this is the biggest landslide that's ever been recorded. And so this is what it looked like. This is what it looks like now, basically. So here's an example of a shield versus a composite volcano. So this is the Hawaiian volcano. Notice how big and broad it is. Notice what a composite volcano looks like in comparison. These are very tall mountains, but they're not as big as a shield. Finally, we get these things called flood basalts, and flood basalts are like it's a crack on the uh, landscape that allows magma to just sort of flow and spread out. They tend to be less violent, but they're really big in size. Here's where you tend to find them, Nevada, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Montana. Not currently active in the United States anyway. An earthquake, well, what causes them? Well, faulting is the most common reason, landslide and volcanic activity. In fact, volcanic activity is often preceded by many, many, many earthquakes. So that gives you a sense that something's happening. So they're kind of connected in a way. So think about an earthquake as the buildup of pressure or the strain that's built up over time. Eventually that snaps. Think about a rod that you're bending. Eventually when the rod breaks, that break releases energy and that energy is an earthquake. So there are two methods of measuring earthquakes, magnitude and intensity. Magnitude is measured, it's a measure of the shaking or the energy released. Intensity is the effect of an earthquake on the people and the damage that is caused, okay? So oftentimes when an earthquake happens, you tend to have a P or primary, get it? followed by S waves that are called secondary. Get it, they come second, primary first, S secondary. And then you tend to have what are called surface waves, which is what usually tends to do the majority of the damage, okay? And the bigger the amplitude, the bigger the damage, the more damaging that earthquake happens to be, okay? So ground motion versus energy. There's usually in ground motion, there's a 10 scale. So a magnitude two earthquake is 10 times stronger than a magnitude one. A magnitude three is 100 times stronger than a magnitude one. A four is 1,000, 10,000, 100,000. In terms of energy, a magnitude two is 32 times 
or releases 32 times more energy than a magnitude one. A magnitude three releases a thousand times more energy than a magnitude one. Get it? 32 times 32 is 1024. 1024 times 32 is 32768. This times 32 is that. That times 32 is this. Get it? So the energy factor is it by a magnitude of 32. Ground motion is a magnitude difference of 10. So 10, 10 squared, 10, 100 squared, 1,000 squared, and so on. Uh, so that is the presentation for today, um, again, focusing on the different landscapes, the different faults, the different forces, the different plate boundaries and motions that happen. Um, if you have any questions, let me know and come to the live office hour or send me an email. Otherwise, I hope you're doing well, and I look forward to interacting with you. Talk to you soon. Bye.